Well, good morning. good morning. All right. My name is Walt Tanner, one of the pastors here at Capstone. Uh, and like Carly and John said, we are so glad that you have joined us here. Uh, this first week of Advent, we're starting a new Christmas series called All I Want for Christmas. Uh, so as we talk about a Merry Christmas, uh, it's going to be Merry for lots of different reasons. For some of you, it's going to be Merry because 2020 is almost over and you are excited about that. Uh, for others, it's Merry because you've already got the COVID and you're a superhero. Uh, pretty much you can walk anywhere uh, you want and uh, you're not going to get sick and you don't need uh, that vaccine that might turn us all into zombies. But uh, other than that, you're excited. Uh, and then, you know, some of you are, it's a Merry Christmas because uh, some of the things that we took for granted in 2019 became a reality for you. Maybe it was that you had to postpone your wedding and you went ahead and had just a smaller family engagement where you uh, went through those things again, that we could just get married or that we could have a birthday party or the idea that uh, we can go on vacation or that you got to go back to school and college uh, or even that you retired this year. Um, there's lots of different things that we took for granted in 2019 uh, that we said in 2020, man, it's just a Merry Christmas because we get to come to church. And so as we talk about that, um, no one knew that 2020 was going to take a turn. Like in 2019 at Christmas, we're like, hey man, 2020, man, it's going to have 2020 vision and we're all just going to get so much accomplished. And, you know, all of us churches and organizations had these 2020 marks that we wanted to accomplish. And then uh, March came and it all went backwards. But the reality is, is that 2020 is going to be a, it's going to be a stamp on the timeline of history. History, maybe even a scar. And throughout history, there have always been these times where there was life before then and there was life after. So, you know, many of us know September 11th and we knew what it was like to travel and fly on airplanes before uh, September 11th and there was life after. Some of you lived through the Cold War and, and you remember, you know, diving under your desk and, and nuclear bombs going back and forth over the idea of that threat that there was, hey, we, we knew life before and there was life after. You know, some of you know, I, my grandparents or maybe your parents, they, uh, they lived through the depression and they never threw anything away. And you were reminded of that during Thanksgiving uh, because uh, your grandmother, she took that tinfoil that, you know, you brought the turkey on and you went to throw it away. She said, no, don't throw good tinfoil away because one day we might need that. And she has a whole drawer full of tinfoil from 1958. Uh, and some of you are, have carried that on. Um, some of you, are like my grandparents, uh, they just grew up in the depression. So they, they held tight on this stuff. I remember my grandfather, uh, we went to get his lawnmower fixed. And the guy said, hey, uh, Mr. Tanner, it'll only be $2 to fix your lawnmower. He was outraged that it would take $2 to, to fix his lawnmower. Now he could have bought a hundred lawnmowers, but in his mind to spend money to fix his lawnmower was not acceptable. Uh, you know, some of, you know, there were stories of people um, who grew up in the depression and they never put their money in banks because when banks went under, uh, families lost everything. So they always kept it in their mattress and uh, in walls and just weird places. Why? Because there was a time stamp that happened in their life. And the understanding of uh, when we grow up, we read about history and we never really think about uh, being a part of history. We, we grow up learning about history, but we really don't think about living through history. And when we live through history, it changes us. When we live through history, uh, it, it changes society and culture. Um, you know, there those who during World War II just changed their outlook of everything. And I know people uh, still to this day who will not buy a Honda, they will not buy a Toyota, and they will not buy a BMW because they won't buy a BMW, anything from Germany, because you know why? They lived through the terror of uh, the Nazi German regime. And so even no matter how nice that car is, they're not going to buy anything from Germany because they remember what it was like getting those news reports. They, they heard about all the World War II. It just wasn't in the history, but, but they lived it. You know, same thing for, for Toyotas and, and the Japanese and the way that they trade POWs. They were like, we'll never buy anything from there. Not because they learned about it in a history book, but because they lived through history and it changed their outlook on life. So when we live through, not just learn about history, but when we live through history and it's our reality, it changes us. Now, that is still yet to be determined how 2020 is going to change us. And in 50 years, I might be telling my grandkids, say, Grandpa, why do you have that door full of 100 rolls of toilet paper locked? Why, why, won't, why can't we ever go in there? It's like, well, son, there once was a time where there was no toilet paper. Or the idea that they're in my truck and they open my glove compartment and 50 masks fall out. It's like, Grandpa, why do you have all these masks? You're like, well, you never know. You might have to go to a store and you have to wear a mask. Um, or the idea of why do you start ticking every time someone says social distancing uh, or that? What, why, what is up with that? I don't really know. I don't know. In 50 years, there's going to be something. But what we are living through is transforming us. 
As Christ followers, the most important timeline marker was literally the one that split time in half. There was BC before Christ and then AD after. The idea of going there literally was a time that changed the course of not only history, but changed eternity. And so as we talk about that, that's what really Christmas is about, this, this coming Messiah. And the people who were living in history at that point didn't really know that, they, that this would be such a game changer. Just like in 2020, we're living through something that may change the course of human history. We don't really know. But 2,000 years ago, there were men and women who were walking the streets of Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Nazareth. They didn't really know what was coming down the pipeline, but God knew. God knew that it would be the perfect time to send his son to rescue and redeem the world. God knew that the people who were in place would be a part of the narrative. He knew that the disciples would, would, be, would rise up and they would walk beside Jesus and, and carry his mission on. God knew that even in the chaos of, uh, of darkness that, that God knew what was going on. And, and we need to take take. Um, that into our hearts as we kind of go, man, God must kind of be leaving us alone. And he doesn't even, God knows, and he is at work. And so God knew everyone's future would be changed by the historic event that would literally split time in half as we celebrate Christmas. And so right now we don't really understand, but God's at work because remember we learn about history and then there's living through history. That we're living in history right now that God is in work and it, it might be shifting just things around us. It might be getting our attention. It, it might be cherishing those things that are so dear to us. Or like I said in the beginning, maybe not taking those things for granted that we often did before 2020. So what does that look like in our lives, in our futures? And so we're starting this series called All I, All I Want for Christmas. Now, when we hear this, we, uh, I normally, we jump to that Mariah Carey song, which one is one of the most divisive debates of whether you love that song. And it's just like, that is the heart of Christmas for you. And listening to her break glass when she goes so high because all she wants for Christmas. Or you want to take your shotgun and throw it up in the, uh, there used to be these things called CDs. And you used to play music on them. Um, and, and so, or whether you want to shoot the old CD with your, uh, with your shotgun, but it's a, it's a hotly debated thing. Right behind is Die Hard, a Christmas movie or not a Christmas movie. Yes, amen, praise. I, <laughs> love when I can get a church talking. All right, so I am team Christmas movie for Die Hard, just FYI. So uh, as we talk about those things, we think about whether a song, um, but also we might think about our kids. So I have three boys and my youngest, and we, you know, thank goodness Amazon sent a catalog because, you know, they wouldn't want anything if they didn't have a catalog or Target. And he says, Dad, I want this for Christmas and I want this for Christmas. And, and we gently remind, um, we gently remind him that we say, hey, is it your birthday? And he's like, no, it's, it's not my birthday. And we're like, whose birthday is it? It's Jesus's birthday. And so as we say that, we reminded that, hey, remember, that's why we give gifts because ultimately Christ was a gift to us. And so whether you're here at church for the first time uh, or in a long time, or if you're watching online for the first time, we, we'd love to tell you that's what Christmas is about. It's that Christ came and that he was the gift to us. And that's why we give gifts. And that's why it's so important that we remember that if we say, hey, all I want for Christmas is a bunch of lists or a bunch of things. And then we get sucked into the idea that Christmas is about me. But reality is it's all about Christ and the idea that he came and that he split time in half. So as we talk about that, what if, and, and John kind of told us earlier, but what if there was a list and, and we look through the lens of all I want for Christmas is from Jesus. That Jesus said, hey, well, this is what I want for my birthday. If he could say, hey dad, hey, this is what I want for my people. And that's what we find in John 17. So if you have your Bibles, we encourage you to go ahead and open that. Or if you have your app, or if you're watching at home, go ahead and open that. And if you don't, you'll see it up on the screen behind me. But we're going to be looking at John 17. And here we see it. It starts out by saying, hey, here's my desire. This is a prayer. This is, God, this is Jesus talking. It's, it's actually in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he's going to be taken into trial. And he's going to be beaten. He's going to be hung on a cross. Jesus is praying this prayer to his father. And he says, hey, father, here is my request. Or here is my desire or if we want to look through the lens of Christmas, here's what I would want for Christmas. So uh, let's turn to John 17. We're going to be uh, verses 24, 25, and 26. This is a long prayer that actually starts in verse one and Jesus prays for himself. So he's, he's praying just like we would. He's praying for strength. He knows there's a storm coming. Then he prays for his disciples because he knows the disciples are going to have to go through a hard time. And then verses 20 through 26, he prays for you. 
He prays for me. He prays for those who are followers of him. And this is what he says in verse 24. He says, Father, I desire. All right, he says, hey, dad, here's what I want for Christmas. He says, hey, here's what I desire. That they also whom you have given to me, that's you and me, the, new, the church, that they would be with me where I am. That they would see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous father, even though the world does not know you, I know you and these that you have sent to me. I made known to them your name and I will continue to make, no, make it known to them that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So we begin to see that, that his request looks like this, is that he's praying for, uh, for us to experience what we were created for. This first part, he says, look, here's what I want them to experience, to see and savior the glory, his glory. He says, I want them to know you through me. Because remember what he told his disciples, he says, hey, disciples, this is earlier in, in, in scripture, in the gospels. He says, hey, if you see me, you see the father. He says, here's what I want for my church is that they would know, they would know what they were created for, to see and to savor the glory of the father in Christ. And he just doesn't stop there. And then verse 26, he says, look, I want them to know your love, father. Dad, I want them to, I want them to feel what I feel. Hey, I want them to experience what I experienced. I want them to know what I know. I know that if they could feel your love, Father, that, that, that you have for me, there's no way they would ever be the same. Their Christmas would be forever changed. That's what I want for Christmas. Eugene Peter says it this way about verse 26 in his, his translation called the, pa the message. It says, so that your love for me might be in them exactly as I am in them. And that's a gift. The understanding that Jesus says, look, I want them to have purpose, what they were created for. I want them to know why they were created ultimately to, to, to live and to worship the glory that is seen in me. And two, that they would know the love that I have seen and experienced. And that's one of the greatest gifts you can have, a, a finding purpose. Because if you don't have purpose, then you're just floating on this spinning ball of dirt and you're just kind of floating in, in, in the universe if you don't have a purpose. We said this uh, in, in our marriage series that, look, the purpose of marriage isn't just about happiness, but about holiness. That it's about taking two good worshipers and making you one great worshiper. That's the purpose. And if you don't have a purpose, you're just aimlessly kind of going through life. And God says, look, Jesus says, I want them to know their purpose and why they were created. But just not that purpose, but they would have a fuel for that purpose. And that's the love of the Father. That we would know how much the Father loves us. And so as, as we experience that, Jesus' prayer, he, he's thinking of us, what's best for us. And this Christmas, we want that to be ingrained in you. So when you hear all I want for Christmas, we go, man, oh yeah, you know what? In John 17, Christ says he would want or what his desires would be that I have purpose and understanding that I would experience the love of the Father. So that's kind of, that's what we're gonna do each week of Advent. And you're, you might be going, well, what is Advent? Because you may not have grown up in church or like me, I grew up in church, but we didn't really, we weren't in a church that celebrated Advent. Well, Advent means expectant waiting. It's the idea that we prepare our hearts for the celebration of the coming Messiah, of his birthday. The idea that there's this long expectant waiting of the celebration of his first coming, but then we're still waiting for his second coming. So this just prepares our heart. And so a lot of times we spend more time preparing for decoration and what's going to be under the Christmas tree and what I'm going to wear to the ugly sweater con contest at my, at my office or, you know, all the Christmas cards you're going to get or send out and all that. Good. We spend more time preparing those things than actually preparing our hearts. And that's what Advent, so the church fathers a long, 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 long time ago said, hey, I'm, we're going to give them an outline. And each week they'll focus on those things, preparing their heart. And that's what Advent really is about. And each week we light a candle. And this week we see that the first candle, the purple candle, is the candle of hope. So that's what we're going to talk about today as we just look through that lens of John 17 of all Christ wants for us is, is the idea that we would find purpose and experience the love. Now we're going to look through that lens of hope. And so there are many of us here who are today and we, we live without Christ and to live without Christ truly is to live without hope. And some of us have those mental and spiritual scars because we tried to do it ourselves. 
We, we try to fill that God-sized hole in our soul and we never could do that. We try to self-medicate through the things of the world, but it really is a hopeless world if you don't have Christ. And so as we talk about that, if we talk about that coming Messiah, and you may know this, that, or not know this, but let's just go back to the basics. The Bible has two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And really it's kind of that split. There's before Christ and the story of Christ coming and the story of his church. In the Old Testament, there, there was a 400 year reign, basically 400 year period where, where we don't hear from God. We don't hear, Israel doesn't hear from the Lord. And it's just a, a period of darkness. And it's not until Christ's birth announcement that, we, that God breaks the silence. So Israel was very hopeless. It was very dark. Remember, there was an empire, the Roman Empire had come in and conquered Israel. And so there was this oppression that was over them. So they felt very hopeless. And in 2020, that might be your story as well. That 2020 started out with a bang and man, you were going to get things done. You had a 2020 vision and all this stuff. And then, man, then Corona hit and, and you lost your job or you couldn't hang out with people. Or you kind of went into that dark place of depression and or, or just things haven't gone the way that you ha had planned. And so you may feel that same place Israel was of, of just darkness and hopelessness and, and understanding that um, if you feel that it can be found. The hope can be found in a promised child that would come to the city of Bethlehem and, and Christ would be born. And it's a beautiful story, which is what we're going to talk about the entire month of December. But that's where Israel's hope would be found. And still 2000 years later is the hope where we are meant to have. Uh, so we're going to look at the very beginning of the Christmas story in Luke 1. Again, this is a very familiar passage. Every Christmas we look at it. But we're going to look at it through the lens of all I want for Christmas. So if Christ tells us that, hey, I want them to have purpose and I want them to know the love, what does it look like through Luke 1? So let's look at this, Luke 1. Now, this guy named Gabriel, he's an angel. He comes and he hangs out with Mary. Now, Mary was a young girl. She was engaged to a guy named Joseph. Now they were, they were going through the motions and planning their wedding day and all that good stuff. And, you know, this angel shows up and says, hey, Mary, you're pregnant. Mary says, nope, not, that can't be. I went to Roper Mountain. I know this whole, how this whole thing works. I went to sex education in middle school. All right, this is impossible because I'm a virgin. I haven't, I'm engaged, but I haven't been with Joseph. And so there's no way this is possible. And, and, and the angel Gabriel responds and you see in verse uh, 37, he says this, I love this response. If you need to underline this, circle this in your Bible, because I think we need to remind it, especially in 2020. For nothing will be impossible with God. And then hear Mary's response. And then Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And so we begin to see that what seems impossible becomes possible through God. We begin to see that hope that seemed hopeless is now possible because of God. So we begin to see that Mary, remember, she wakes up that day and her life is normal. She's just living in history. She doesn't know the next day that she wakes up that she's going to have a message from the Lord in Gabriel. Joseph later will, she goes, okay, well, I'll go tell Joseph and, and obviously he'll, he'll be okay with it, but it doesn't go that way. It says that he's actually planning to divorce her or cut off their engagement until a until Gabriel goes and hangs out with him as well. He's just living his life. He's just wanting to set up his own, his own carpentry shop. He, he, he wants to just do life with Mary, who he's been promised and, and to raise a child. He didn't know that God was going to interrupt his life and begin to give him purpose and begin to understand what God was going to do in and through him, that God was going to use him to transform history. All right, so let's get to the application piece. If, again, the idea is that we just don't want you to come hang out at church. We want you to be transformed by what we are talking about. And, and that's called application. That means, hey, you know what? I'm going to take what I'm learning and move forward and say, I want to be closer to God tomorrow than I am today. I want to be closer this Christmas than last Christmas. So how do we do that? So let's go ahead and establish. Look, Christ, was, what's he want for Christmas? That we have a purpose and we want to experience the love. And then if we look that through the lens of hope, here's the question I have for you today. Where do you need more hope in your life to find that purpose and to find that love? 
Where does there need to be more hope in your life? Where, where's that hopelessness in you? And, and your response might be the same as Mary's. They're going, that's impossible, Walt. That there's no way that, that would bring me hope and experience the love of the Father. There's no way that could happen because 2020 is very hopeless. There's nothing redeemable about this year. So let's just get through the end of the year, 2021. We can start fresh and we can start anew. I want to ask that question. What, where's that hope in your life? It might be this week that you've experienced the, the damage done in relationships through a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter who you raised and who has left and who hasn't come back. And there was a seat empty at the dinner table. So there's no way. So, well, if you want me to have hope and if you want me to have purpose and love, then that prodigal son or daughter needs to come back. And if you knew the fight that we had or if you knew what they had done, there's, you would know there's no way they're going to come back. Or for some of you, um, it might be a, a mountain of financial debt and there's no way you can get out of that, that, that hole. I saw on Black Friday, man, we are knocking it out of the park of just burying ourselves in debt because we spent $9.1 billion in one day. $9.1 billion in one day. Swiping, 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 digging, digging, digging. For some of you, you're like, well, if you knew the, the student debt I had, or if you knew how much I had on credit cards, or you knew, how, if you knew all that stuff, you would see it will be impossible for me to get out from under this. It's just a burden I'm going to have to bear. Well, maybe not if we really believe that the impossible, the impossible is possible with God. It might be racial reconciliation that God put that on your heart of, of what you experienced in 2021. Going, man, I, you know, I want to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. So what is that impossible thing that God says, here's what I want to see hope. Here's how I want to experience that love. And God puts something on your heart. We really believe that here, that the Holy Spirit, there's God in heaven and there's God on earth in Christ. And there's God in us called the Holy Spirit that he puts inside of us movement. He puts inside of us purpose and he wants us to bring forward just like he did with Mary going, hey, we are putting inside of you, but literally Jesus and saying, hey, here's how I want to put inside of you to move forward. We're going to read uh, Proverbs 3, 5, uh, and 6. And this is a scripture for me that I've had to, I've had to kind of hide in my heart for 2020. Um, because I like to solve problems. And one of the things I've learned is I can't solve all the problems of 2020. And this is what it says. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding in all, in, in all your ways. Acknowledge him. Acknowledge that he's God and you're not. He's the problem solver, not you. He can make the impossible possible, not me. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. So the word for me, and you've heard me say this, and I've been saying it in sermon after sermon after sermon in 2020. Some of you have caught the theme, some of you haven't. But trust is that I've got to trust that he's God and I'm not that he knew the perfect time to send Jesus. He knew when to split time in half. He knew that 2020, that he is preparing us, even though we read about history, now we're living through history, that he is forming inside of us a transformation and we have to trust him. Even though there it seems dark, even though it seems we're in a storm right now, even it, it, we can't just lean on our own understanding. But that is that we have to trust him. We can't trust in what we see, we can't trust what we read in the newspaper, or what we read on blogs or social media. We can't trust even what's fair. If I was God, here's what I would do. We can't trust those things. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Now, Mary was a good Jewish girl. She probably knew this proverb in her heart and it may have been Proverbs 3 may have popped up in her heart when Gabriel says, hey, by the way, you're pregnant with child and even though you're not married and she says, okay, I am the Lord's servant. Proverbs 3 says, do trust the Lord and do not lean on your own understanding. Some of you may have gotten news this year that you go, you know what? I need to trust the Lord and not lean on my understanding. Trust the Lord and, and understand that he's God and I'm not. Trust the Lord, not social media. Trust the Lord, not the negative people in your life who continue to pull you down. Trust the Lord, not what the world tells you is right. Trust the Lord. Because here's the fact, is that if we trust the Lord and we believe in him, then and only then will we begin to see things transformed. 
Because if you say, well, I don't see much hope in things getting different and getting better, you're right. Things aren't just going to get better. But my hope has to be in the one, again, it's not me who fixes things, but the Lord. I, I trust him. And that, by the way, when you trust him, that doesn't mean everything's going to be easy. It doesn't mean every, there's not going to be struggle. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be okay. Sometimes you're going to go through a, a valley in order to get to the mountain top. And what does that look like in your life? Zach said it last week, Zach Dixon, who spoke, he said, he said the, the best fruit's not grown on the, on the mountaintop, it's grown in the valley. So where are you trusting him in that valley? Because here's the deal, I, we need to trust that the Lord loves us. Now, my kids tell me all the time, Dad, you're mean. Dad, you're not fair. They're not wrong. I can be mean and I cannot be fair. But that doesn't mean I don't love them. Because guess what? They trust me when things get scary, they run to dad. They trust me that I'm going to take care of them. And it may, they may not see it, but I love them. And so sometimes what, I, what seems mean and not fair is helping shape them into the men I want them to be. And there might be some storms in your life that God is, is ushering you in for your good. And you got to trust him in that. There, there might be some things that are going on in your life right now that you don't really understand. Just like Mary when she's told that you trust him. That you lean not, in on, your under, you lean not on your understanding. And so the idea, of, again, my hope can't be in the things of this world. My hope can't be in what makes sense. My hope has to be in the one who created the world. My hope has to be in the things and the purpose that I've been created for and the love that he has for me. Jesus says, if I could get one gift, it would be that my church would see their purpose, that they would experience your love. That's only gonna happen when we trust. Again, let's, let's trust and in, in not in what we do, but what Christ has done, our trust in him. Here's your big idea. If you're new to Capstone, we try to have a, a big idea that again, kind of summarizes all that we've been kind of talking about. You can share this on social media. You can have uh, discussions of, of what this looks like in your life, maybe over coffee with a neighbor or with your spouse. But hey, here, here's our big idea, simply this. This Christmas, Jesus wants, wants you to know that when we place our hope in him, anything is possible. Anything is possible. Again, our hope isn't that things are just going to change. My hope is in Jesus. And whether they change or not, guess what? Jesus is still king. And that's where my hope has to be in. And that's where our prayer has to be. When Gabriel comes to Mary, it didn't make sense. Mary couldn't lean on her own understanding, but she had to trust the Lord. She had to place her hope in the Father's hands. As she receives this news, like, hey, man, I hope. Joseph understands. No, my hope is in you, Lord. And whether he understands or not, that's up to him and how you work in and through him. But my hope is in you. So, so too many of us, we place our hope in the wrong things. Like we said in the marriage series, our hope can't be in our spouse. It has to be in Jesus. Our hope can't be that the economy turns around to get out of debt. It's got to be in Jesus. Our hope can't be, man, I really hope I get that Christmas bonus. My hope can't be in what's under the tree. My hope can't be in that stuff. My hope has to be in a savior. Because when we have our hope in him, guess what? The impossible is possible. So here's what we want to, I want to challenge you with uh, this, this Advent season. So we've got about, uh, we've got actually four more sermons. We've got uh, four, three more Sundays and, and one Christmas Eve service. So we've got four more candles. But here's what we want you to do in this next, this next process is this, is we, here's what I want to challenge you. I want you to pray an impossible prayer. So I want you to pray a prayer where, man, unless God shows up, just like in Mary's story, that unless God shows up, there's no way that is possible. I want you to pray that prayer. So pray a prayer, whether it is for that prodigal son or daughter, or whether it is that financial debt, or whether it is reconciliation, or whether it is, whatever it may be, you're going, you know what, God, I want to pray an impossible prayer uh, of where I want to see you work. Too many of us play it safe with our prayers, or selfish with our prayers. We go, God, God here's where I want to see just an impossible prayer. Now, here's the thing. 
When we pray impossible prayers, it's not just that we pray these prayers of going, God, I want you to do this amazing thing, but it's we got to pray a prayer and then we got to listen. Because God's going to may ask you to move to make that impossible po prayer possible. He may use you in a mighty way, just like Mary says, okay, here's the impossible that's going to be possible. And here's where I've got to say, okay, God, I'm willing. I'm willing to do that. So if you're saying, I'm praying for someone's salvation who doesn't know you, who is lost and dead in their trespasses, they need Jesus. So God, I'm going to pray for that person who is hell bound. I'm going to pray for them. And then God says, okay, that's great. I'm, I'm, that is a good prayer. That is a valid prayer. I want you to take them to, to coffee. And I, want them to, I want you to share your story. God, there's no way I could do that. Hey, all things are possible. God, I, I want to redeem my, my, my relationship with my son or daughter, with that, that, that family member. But if you knew the fight that we had, or if you knew what they did when my, when, when my father passed away, or if you knew the, the, the issues we had last Christmas, it's impossible. God might say, okay, well, let's pray for reconciliation. But then he might say, okay, now I need you to reach out to them. You may need to forgive them. Let's make the impossible possible, but you got to listen. It may be that God calls you to get out of financial debt because it's a burden that you're carrying. He says, okay, I want you to live below your means and you need to listen. And he might say, cut up your credit cards. He might say, change your lifestyle. But the idea is that, hey, I want racial reconciliation. That might mean that you open up your home and you begin to have tough conversations with other people. But we can't pray impossible prayers and not listen because, hey, God, I'm going to pray an impossible prayer. But now what do you want me to do? And I'm willing to go and be and do whatever it needs me to be to make this possible. What's that look like in your life? Well, Walt, I don't believe in impossible prayers. Can I tell you that you're living in one? Twelve years ago, two families decided, hey, you know what? What is it like to start a new church in a, in a, in a small town? And there were just two families and I quit my job and we moved in with the bare nose and we said, well, if, if not anything, we've at least got two families. And we paid this impossible prayer. It's like, God, all right, God, we're, we're going to step out in faith and we're praying for the city of Fountain Inn and God, whatever you do with it, we're willing to do whatever it is. And so we quit our jobs and, and we started this impossible prayer that you're living in. So don't say impossible prayers aren't reality because you're a part of one. Or if you've ever been to Haiti, guess what? That was an impossible prayer. A church of a hundred people taking on an orphanage and, and the ministry and partnership with Pastor Andy. We said, God, we don't have the time. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. But God, we believe in Pastor Andy and what he's doing there. So we're going to pray this impossible prayer that somehow, some way you keep this orphanage and you keep this church planning movement going. And 11 years later, it still is. And we've purchased land and we've built them a new orphanage. Why? Because we prayed an impossible prayer and we were willing to do whatever it took for that possible, impossible to become possible. Whether it's a church plant in Clinton, whether it's an after school program here, you guys are living day after day after day of the impossible prayers of others. So here's what God asks of you that you would be, have the courage to pray impossible prayers. And it might mean someone's salvation, it might mean reconciliation, it might be building bridges. It might be a new organization. It might be church planning. It might be doing something crazy that you never even thought of, but you just simply ask, and God says, Hey, here's the impossible prayer I want you to pray. Because the moment we stop praying impossible prayers is the moment that we just do it under our own strength and we don't really trust God. So this Christmas, let's not just pray for things under the tree and our hope is in what we wrap, unwrap, but let's pray impossible prayers and our hope, not in what we can accomplish, but what God's gonna accomplish through us. Let's pray some pretty big prayers. And guess what? I'm just gonna be real honest. That prayer might not be answered in 2020. That prayer might be answered in 2021. It might be answered in 2030. It might be answered in 2050. So don't think that God's not good because he didn't answer your prayer. No, understand your job is to simply go and he says, you have not because you ask not. I, there's, we want revival in this city. And we've been praying for that for, for 12 years and, and we've seen a lot of good stuff, but I'm okay with it. You know what? It might be the next generation that sees the fruit of our prayers. It might be the next generation that sees racial reconciliation and not mine, but you know what? We're the ones that are called to till the soil. That even if God, quote unquote, doesn't show us our answered prayer, that he's still faithful and he's still good. And our hope isn't in a, in a quote unquote, a packaged prayer that go, oh, look how good God is. That sometimes it's just going, God, I want to be faithful and my hope is in you. And I just want to be obedient in that. So man, this Christmas, 
Let's not make a all I want for Christmas and all this list of all the things that I want from Amazon. But let's listen to the prayer that God, that Jesus had for him. Say, hey, hey, dad, here's what I want. My desire is that they would know their purpose. That they would see they were created to worship you. And they would see your glory through me. And that they would experience the same love that I have experienced through you as well. So what does that look like this Christmas in your life? For some, it might be going, you know what? I'm not even a Christ follower. And I, wanna, I want to give my life to him. Come talk to me or other leadership. We'd love to point you in that direction. For others, it might be the, putting down the sin of materialism and realizing it's not your birthday like we're teaching our seven-year-olds, but it's the Christ's birthday. Whatever that might be in your life, that you would just simply be obedient in that and move forward. So again, may our hope not be in this world. May our hope not be in ourselves, but may our hope be in Christ. And when our hope is in Christ, he can do the impossible and make it possible through you. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now thanking you, God, that it's just not what we can accomplish, but it's when we surrender to you that you accomplish the impossible. God, that we see churches planted. God, that we see orphanages built. And God, that we see so much done in your kingdom, in your glory. And it really is in response to what you prayed in John 17. That we would just simply see the response of our purpose and God experiencing your love. And so, Lord, now I pray for those who are hearing this message, both online, God, that are in this room, in this house, Lord, that they, they would feel the stir of the Holy Spirit moving in them. God, that there would be a, a, an impossible prayer that there would well up, that they're going to pray this, this entire Advent season of the expectant waiting of the celebration of your birth, Christ, but then also the expectant waiting of your second coming. God, that we would say that you have given us mission and you have given us purpose. So, Lord, I pray that we would just not sit and just, just watch the world burn, Lord, but, God, that we would get water and that we would ask you, hey, where is it the fire that we need to put out? And, God, that you would use us, God, that, you would, that we would be obedient, that we would pray impossible prayers, but not just on prayer impossible prayers, but we would sit and that we would listen and that we would respond in obedience, just as Mary did when she heard the impossible. And she said, I am your servant, and I will do as you say. We love you and we praise you. In your son's holy name, amen. so glad that you have joined us this morning uh, online to worship with our capstone family here is what our big idea was this christmas jesus wants us to know that when we place our hope in him anything is possible and hope is a really beautiful thing but as this year comes to an end many of us have been challenged in where to place our hope this christmas let's give christ his greatest desire that our hope would be in him this week, you can dig deeper uh, into today's message through the Gathering Insights, which we can be found on the Capstone app. And again, thank you guys so much for watching online. We would love to connect with you. You can connect via our social media platforms or our website, which is www.capstonechurch.net. Or we would love to see you in person in one of our future gatherings. You guys are sent out. Have a good day.